How's it going, Alex? How's your week going? Good, good. How are you? Awesome. I'm doing well. I'm glad that uh, we were able to do this. Just want to say thank you so much, man. It really means a lot. We can hop right in. I'm super excited to have you on In Their 20s today to talk about Wally, which you guys are building a rewards application that makes it much easier to, for people to understand and own Bitcoin. Before we get there, though, you know, I want to talk about your 20s. I want to talk about your journey as an entrepreneur. And uh, I want to talk about why you're so bullish on Bitcoin and what got you into Bitcoin as well. So how does that sound? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a lot to, to cover. Let's do it. Sweet. Let's start and bring it way back to your college days. Uh, you attended the University of North Carolina, graduated with a degree in econ. What is one routine that you started while in college that you still use today? Hmm, good question. Um, a few things come to mind. Uh, one, Twitter. Uh, big, like uh, one of my professors uh, basically made everybody in the class uh, get, get uh, a Twitter account and handle and we had a competition in the class uh, to actually uh, like win um, based on what we could do for a potential local business and blow up their Twitter account to kind of like learn learn Twitter. So I uh, mm. got really into into Twitter. Uh, I think like junior year, um, and yeah, that that kind of changed my trajectory because I I would say a uh, vast majority of people I've met um, in a professional sense. Um, that have really accelerated my career came from Twitter. And I really, I mean, to be honest, I hated it in the early days. Uh, I thought it, it was just like, it didn't feel productive. didn't feel like I was like learning anything. And granted, the platform has changed dramatically since I think 2009, 2010. Um, but uh, it, it's changed my life completely of getting active. You can, you can meet absolutely anybody in the world on Twitter. And uh, it, it really just gives you this ability to have like your finger on the pulse of like what's actually happening in the world or what's happening in your industry. So I, I would say Twitter changed my life in a big way. And I started that in college. Um, and then uh, what are some other things? Um, LinkedIn, weirdly, like I, <laughs> I would say, and then like getting really good at emailing, cold emailing. Mm. Um, I think back in the day uh, I, I did, did some internships and kind of just, I, I always said this approach of like, I started a few businesses back in the day and literally would just like, you know, knock on doors uh, for said businesses. So cold emailing and cold calling always kind of felt like the, the transition of, of like knocking on doors. And it, 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 the, I think just seeing the, the, the success and seeing what, you know, the people you could meet by knocking on doors and cold calling, even though a lot of times it was uh, really tough and, and uh, you know, you're, you're failing 99% of the time, um, you start to figure out patterns that of what, what makes people respond uh, basic human psychology of like why somebody is going to be interested. Like, what are you doing to help them? Uh, why should they even answer you? So, you know, it, really learning that early on just through repetition and pattern recognition. Um, and so, yeah, I was like a fiend for uh, back in the day of like emailing random people that I wanted to meet. I almost felt like, um, you know, if we're going even further back to like when I was like 11, I, it was like, you know, the internet in the early days, of the internet used to be so weird and fun and different. It was like, you know, you could just hop into any forum and learn absolutely anything. Meanwhile, I'm like, you know, in school and frustrated because of my, I don't feel like my teachers don't know everything. And like, you know, I, I felt like I was like learning so much on the internet because there was, you know, unlimited information and unlimited paths I could go uh, to, to learn said information. I, I, I kind of felt like um, that transition helped me see sort of what the internet could unlock and, and the people I could sort of meet through that. So um, yeah, I mean, I would, I would just cold email someone I would want to meet and I would be like, Hey, uh, you know, I'd love, you know, 15 minutes of your time. And I think I can be helpful in this way, this way, this way. And that sort of very basic formula, uh, just let me like meet a lot of very interesting people and open a lot of doors. And I would honestly be like, you know, shocked with some of the people that would respond to me. I um, mean, CEOs, like world leaders, like, like, you know, people that I really respected, uh, that would that would email me back in, in 10 minutes because it was a compelling enough pitch or I was actually you know maybe able to convince them that I could help them so uh, yeah that was always a that was always some uh, something I, I think I took away from college uh, less so than most of my curriculum I, I did study economics I did uh, become really fascinated with like microfinance the Grameen Bank uh, a lot of those initiatives that Muhammad Yunus was doing uh, throughout India and Bangladesh to really um, uh, do trickle up economics to really like enable an individual with technology mm -hmm. and then see what the, what that technology did to actually enable, you know, the, these individuals 
um, and give them a better way of life. Uh, that inspired a lot of my ideas and helped me see, uh, you know, the future of cryptocurrency, the future of technology, the future of democratization of, of commerce. Uh, first off, I love your point. And there's a lot I want to break down there. I love your point on mastering the cold email, cold message. It was a cold message that led me to interviewing you. So you know, I think that Here we are. That's, that's something perfect. that 20 something should really, really focus on. I mean, it doesn't always have to be to get a job. If you just want to network with someone, meet someone, learn something new from someone that you really want to get in the same room with, sometimes mastering that perfect, perfect, simple put email, valuable email or message can lead to a lot of opportunities. Um, I also love your point on Twitter and LinkedIn. I know I'm always preaching, like I wish that they taught things like this at school because social media can be important to build credibility, build your personal brand and also network. Super cool hearing that you got to use Twitter in school. So um, very different experience than I had. Uh, so I love that. So now looking at postgrad, um, this is a time when a lot of, you know, 20 somethings are looking to work at large companies, um, you know, a lot of famous companies, you decided to kind of follow the entrepreneurial track. You created a company called Cosmic, which I want you to talk about. This company was acquired by Pop Sugar in 2015 um, and then acquired again in 2017 by Rakuten. Why did you choose the entrepreneurial route? Um, and when could you confidently say that you kind of developed that entrepreneurial bug? Uh, yeah, um, I, I kind of, yeah, I, I feel like I, I knew... <sighs> it's one of those things when I was younger, I didn't know I wanted to be a founder, right? It's like, you don't, you don't think of uh, things. I, I, I personally, maybe, maybe some people do because it, it, now kids growing up uh, tech and being a found quote unquote founder and entrepreneur is very much like, you know, glamorized and, and um, you know, through Hollywood and stuff, but you know, keep in mind when I was a kid, like there, the social network hadn't come out. Like there, you know, fit, you, you, no one really like, yeah, you kind of knew of Steve jobs, I guess, but, uh, Bill Gates is somebody who you remember like, you know, reading about when I was younger, but I didn't really think of like, oh, I want to be a founder. I, I, I just always love building things. And that's always been like a, a source of truth for like me and, and something that I've always known, like really like gets my brain, you know, going and it, and it really excites me. And uh, I know that like when I wake up every day and I have something to build, something to develop, uh, it, it just makes you really happy. It makes you really excited. Uh, and when that thing is, you know, being built for good or, or is, is that, that thing is going to uh, change people's lives or, um, you know, make money for me or, or other people or, um, or the people that, you know, we're changing lives of, uh, that always like, has got me really excited, um, uh, you know, for, from a very young age, um, no, no matter really what I was building. That's always been like a, a very early and central thesis of I love building things. Um, and, and, and I had a few jobs, you know, when I was younger, like internships when I was like 16, 17, 18. And I, I was kind of felt like I was building for other people and what they wanted. And I, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm like, you know, I, I always know, you know, the, the best answer. I mean, I, I surround myself with people who are way smarter than me, uh, you know, throughout my company and, and, you know, investors and mentors and everything like that. I don't, I don't think I really build with an ego, uh, but I definitely felt like early on, I, I didn't want to serve, I, didn't want, I did a lot of like agency work and stuff like that and, and building like one-off projects to make money. And I always kind of felt like, you know, I come in and I'd, so, I'd try to solve like one problem for like a, a client or in something. And I always felt like, you know, either they didn't, you know, go with the best answer or I, I ended up wanting to build a whole company based on the problems that I found after like learning about that company's problems or that individual's problems. So I, I, I think I just quickly realized like I had all these ideas I, I had all these things I wanted to build. And I oftentimes felt like the companies that I was like, you know, potentially working for or looking to work for didn't have all the answers. And I oftentimes would find like the, the most excitement by, by carving my own path or finding like a unique advantage or unique insight of something that I was going to build that I felt like no one else could build or no one else was building. So um, I, I just love building things from scratch, like literally like day one, nothing and then just building it as far and as big and as possible and solving as many problems I, as I possibly can uh, with that thing. Um, and yeah, I just didn't really feel like working for somebody else was necessarily the path where I would be the most excited. Um, so I also have like a very like divergent uh, brain and, and I, I, have a, I feel like I'm very much like a generalist um, in a lot of ways. And, and over time I've become a specialist and, and an expert in a few areas. Um, but I would say like back then when I was like, you know, 20 years old, 22 years old, I was very much just like, 
I loved like doing a mil wearing a million hats and getting my hands dirty. And when, when, in an entry level role at most companies, like you're you're like pigeonholed into like doing like one thing well, and you can learn a ton in that position. But I just knew like my brain, the way that it worked, uh, wasn't as conducive to be successful in a role like that, uh, unless I was coming in being like the the CEO or having like you know just doing special projects or doing whatever I you know was gonna uh, build. So yeah, that's that's probably the the answer, uh, the honest answer. Of course. And quick follow up to that before I ask my next question. Do you think it's more efficient to be, you know, a master of one thing? I mean, now growing up and like having gone through your 20s or I mean, do you still think that it is really smart to be a generalist and like have many different interests, many different um, things that you're able to be valuable and focused on? Yes. Yeah, so the smartest thing is being true to yourself. Like it, it's not about uh, there's not a right answer for everybody. Um, I, not every person should be a founder. There's not like not everybody should be an engineer. Not everyone should be, you know, mm -hmm. community builder. Um, the thing that to, to answer for yourself is like, do you understand the thing that you're going after? And does that make you happy? Does that give you satisfaction? Does it, less so happy, does it make you content? Like, you know, are, are you going to find satisfaction in that, in that path? Um, I think a lot of people, if they had the, you know, the, the, the challenges that I have, they would, they would be extremely unhappy. Um, I can, I don't think I can do anything else after, after doing what I do. Um, but I also like, don't think a lot of people would want to do the jobs that I, that I have to do. Um, the same way that I don't, you know, I, I don't, I wouldn't want to do the, the jobs of somebody else. Like, um, it doesn't, it doesn't really feel like it's, it's like a job, uh, like what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that it, like what I'm doing is, is more glamorous or better than anybody that works with me for me, uh, like in, you know, in parallel, whatever, like, um, you know, you can be an artist and be extremely successful these days. You can be an engineer, be unbelievably successful. You can, you can be like a community manager. Like the, the, what's so cool about the internet is like, you can find your niche, whatever it is, you can find a, a specific thing that you're doing a specialty and, and be like, you know, make ungodly amounts of money by doing something, if it's true to you and you're, and you're going to be good, like people are naturally going to be good at things that they enjoy doing. So I, I think I, I happen to be very good at what I do. And it, it so happens to, I happen to have like a, a generalist sort of like, um, you know, mindset and brain that I like, I like to I extreme ADD, ADD. And I'm like, I can, <laughs> I can take on like, you know, I can, every 15 minutes, I can context switch and make decisions. I can make a, a hundred decisions a day. And when I talk to early founders, a lot of times, you know, if, if you don't have like that sort of mentality, you get bombarded with mm -hmm. decision fatigue because you can't make a hundred decisions a day. Uh, I don't, I mean, knock on wood, but I, I work in 10 years and um, I, I haven't gotten decision fatigue yet. And I, I, I thrive on the chaos. I thrive on the decision making. And I think a lot of people don't. And that's, that's a, that's a, that's a founder thing that like, I know I'm true to myself. I know I can like, you know, make those decisions and, and, and process information at a high speed and uh, me have, you know, uh, 20 meetings a day and, and get excited by it. I love how you don't discredit others for not being like that. I love that you just really are true to the point where you need to be true to yourself. What you do is not going to be for everybody. Um, what other people do is not going to be for you. And I just think that that's a very, very clear, um, you know, thing that you've come to terms with and something that more 20 somethings need to realize. We want to do everything. We want to be involved and have our fingers everywhere and be following what this industry is doing, what people are talking about over here. But no, you need to really find what you're good at, what you want to do, and then really go for it. Um, so we're, yeah, of and course- one, one piece about that too, because I, I do, I do want to expand on it because I, I appreciate you uh, identifying that. It's like the, the way to be successful in life is just to just find something that you are uniquely great at that is uniquely authentic to you. And that is how you're gonna be successful. So I do think like, you know, the the life of a founder is often glamorized, but what you don't see is that most companies fail. And I have seen, I mean, we, I've you know, been very, very fortunate, but I've seen so many companies fail and seen so many founders, you know, go through the path. And if you don't absolutely love it, like I actually feel like if Cosmic had failed, if Lolly was failing, um, I would still be doing the, ex I'd start a third company. Like I just, I love what I'm doing. And I would certainly question like, am I go as good as I think I am at, at what I'm doing? Uh, and what did I do wrong? But you know, the sheer like, you know, math of it, like there's like, unbelievable founders that fail all the time. And if you don't love it, and if you're not naturally good at it, you're going to be so sad uh, at that path. And 
And I also think like what we're seeing now is like founders are being glamorized in this current state. But if you sort of zoom out, like who's going to be, you know, the, the, the founders of tomorrow, like we're, we're seeing right now with like NFTs, like artists are like, you know, celebrities now, like we're seeing mm-hmm. artists make more money than they ever have relatively and more artists make more money. It's not just like, you know, a, a handful. This is, these are, these are people, artists are making an ungodly amount of money. Uh, musicians are going to be making an unbelievable amount of money. If you're a great musician, like why go be a founder? Um, like they're, like the whole idea of being like a, a, a founder or an entrepreneur or whatever, there's entrepreneurial ideas and entrepreneurial things that you can do being an artist, being a founder, being a uh, an engineer. Like mm-hmm. there's just so many cool things you can do right now in the world. It's just like unbelievable. Being a podcaster. I mean, no, I, I literally agree with everything that you're saying. Um, and your track record proves everything that you just said as well. You obviously built Cosmic, five plus year journey, got acquired, and then boom, you're working on Lolly. Uh, I think this is a perfect transition for us to talk about Lolly. Um, you guys want to make Bitcoin accessible to everybody. It's a plug-in on websites. Of course, you have the website Lolly itself as well. Uh, but this is a place where online shoppers can get Bitcoin rewards back on top of their purchases. Um, it's backed by Alexis Ohana. And Serena Ventures, a lot of other amazing people. I know Turner Novak also um, is an investor. I kind of want to dive in and ask first, what got you so bullish on Bitcoin originally? Yeah, so, so the year was uh, 2013, and I was uh, I was crashing on couches doing you know what, what I just kind of mentioned the unglamorous part of of uh, building a company. Uh, we were like bootstrapping um, uh, Cosmic, and um, I, I was like crashing on couches in New York. And a lot of our clients started to pop up in New York. So I was just like, I just need to be in New York. That's where the action's at. That's where like the, you know, the merchants are. That's where people were paying me uh, and, 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 you know, uh, and Cosmic. And so uh, that's where I really felt, or that I, I was like at a bar um, and there was a mutual friend that was there. And uh, this, this guy had just like learned about Bitcoin and was, you know, had, had taken the red pill and, and was, was just all about, uh, all about Bitcoin. So, you know, keep in mind, I was building a company that's mission was to democratize commerce by building a uh, buy button technology and making that accessible for all retailers on all platforms and, and making it accessible for people to buy those said products uh, anywhere they were across the internet. So this guy, you know, tells me that this currency, uh, you know, works for 4 billion people with an internet connection, I guess 3 billion at the time. And that was, uh, I, that just completely, you know, resonated with me and everything that I, you know, believed that should exist in the world. So I saw this opportunity where I was like, oh my God, like, you know, we're, we're hooked into 99 different payment gateways. Why not just, you know, integrate one more with Bitcoin? And, and so we, we actually looked at, we, we pitched this to Target. We pitched this to all these major merchants, Fortune 500 merchants that we had been working with. And we were like, why, why not? Uh, accept Bitcoin as a medium of exchange, uh, as as a you know, method of payment, and uh, we were met with you know very er- early criticism of Bitcoin um, that it didn't deter me personally from getting involved in it, um, but it definitely painted a picture of where Bitcoin was going to be adopted at which t- at, at different times, and these merchants th- their criticism was you know Bitcoin is too volatile, cons- there's not enough consumers that have it for it to be meaningful. Um, and and th- that was, you know, good reason for them not to adopt it. Uh, people didn't necessarily want to pay with something that was going up and down every day, uh, even if it was largely going up. So, um, yeah, we, we kind of saw firsthand of where it wasn't going to be adopted, which was in, for the masses, which was payments. Um, but, you know, what I saw is I, I, I've i always uh, kind of had an approach where um, I, I see things on a very macro lens mm-hmm. um, because I feel like I was always a kid of the Internet and I, I felt like always like connected you know, to people in Bangladesh, people in Ukraine, people in uh, India, like wherever people were, I always felt connected to them. I always kind of felt like, you know, we were, um, we, I never really understood necessarily borders uh, in, the, in the same sense, because I, I felt like I grew up without any borders being like, you know, on the internet, uh, the metaverse, I think is probably, probably people, you know, refer to it now. So what, where, where I kind of felt is like this, like the, the internet didn't re- really have an internet native currency and you know, back in the day when I would be, you know, hiring engineers in Ukraine or or Israel or or India, I knew the challenges of sending money. When I would go send the money, it would be thirty percent less than what, from the time that I sent by the time it got to their, their actual bank account, um, if they even have a bank account. So it, it was always like sort of frustrating for me to send money all around the world, and couple that with the fact that like, you know, I wasn't connected to 
um, you know, billions of people because I didn't have a way of paying them with a truly internet native money. So, you know, all I, I would say like, through pattern recognition in 2013, I had enough lived experiences of building and living on the internet that I knew that Bitcoin solved a very real problem for a, a lot of people. And it may not have solved those problems of merchants, but one thing that has never deterred me is people not agreeing with me and, and not thinking I was right. And I've always felt like, okay, I see this future. I, I see it clear as day. Other people don't have to see it at the same time as me, but I have enough proof points and enough of an independent mind that I can, I can put two and two together to say like, this is the inevitable future. And it's going to either be Bitcoin that is the inevitable future or something eerily similar. And, and you know, now it, I think that let me see, you know, other, you know, cryptocurrencies that let me be, um, you know, really critical of other things that have emerged. Um, and, and really see, I think, what the, the future is. That's a clip right there for the interview. I love that so much because if, you've, if you're passionate about something, if you've done your due diligence, and if you really think something will be more valuable in the future and others are telling you, no, you don't know what the hell you're talking about, you really need to trust your gut. You need to trust your truth. I mean, you spoke about that earlier as well, and you stuck with it and developed Lolly, um, which is amazing. I mean, I know you guys just announced over the summer that you've closed a $10 million Series A funding round. There are a lot of top influencers also involved um, with in uh, this announcement, Logan Paul, Josh Richards. I actually just spoke with Marshall Sandman from Animal Capital about what you're building as well, too. Um, I have kind of a double question here. Um, So the first is, where do you see Lolly, you know, becoming in the future? Like what are like the main goals right now? And number two, you know, for that 20 something founder that's looking to scale a company from nothing into something you've done it once before you had acquired. I am very confident that just with the utility of Lolly that you're going to be able to do it again. And who knows, maybe the third company and fourth in the future, as you said, could come too. what's your advice for scaling a company? Uh, great people. Uh, that is like first and foremost. So um, yeah, I mean, I, Oh, so much, uh, and and um, it's you know it's it's not it's not just me that's building these companies. It's it's uh it, we have an incredible team. So my mm-hmm. my co-founder Matt, uh, first and foremost, uh, we've been building together for ten years now with our last company and now this company. Um, we uh, so definitely like you know finding the right uh, partners that are going to be in the trenches with you through the ups, the downs, and everything, and then. Um, and then also just like making great hires, like, like finding great people that, that believe in a similar mission. So I believe we're up to 12 of our current employees. Uh, we built our last company together out of, uh, I think it's 12 out of like 30 or so. So, um, yeah, I mean, when, when we, when, when I was, you know, ready and Matt was ready to start another company, you know, we got the band back together and, uh, I, I always play the long game. I, I think that that's, uh, you know, fun, been fundamental for, you know, my, my success uh, so far, uh, I treat people with, with re- respect. Um, I, I, you know, live by the fundamental truth of treat people how you want to be treated. Um, you know, I think, I think things, sometimes things get very heated in business. Uh, things get very difficult in business and you have to keep a, like, you know, a level head and you have to like zoom out and play the long game. Like it's never, uh, almost never worth it to, uh, do, you know, do something that you wouldn't um, want to be done, and, you know, and, and and clearly, you know, you can get wronged, uh, but it's it's almost always like you know the the path um, uh, of of being good to people and and treating people with respect, uh, even if they're not, uh, is is almost always uh, the best path. Um, a little you know, a little anecdote um, with our last company, we had a, we had an incredibly difficult time raising money. It really wasn't a venture scale company. Um, and, and almost luckily, like we didn't raise a lot of money. And so the exit was, was, was great, uh, because we didn't raise a lot of money, but that's really because we couldn't raise a lot of money. Um, I, I did the whole Sand Hill road thing. I, you know, pitched to, uh, I think 400 investors probably over the course wow. of those five years. And, and so, I, I mean, those investors, like the ones that told me, no, I, I could have been like really salty. I mean, we had some really extreme lows and there was a lot of times where I, I really felt like, uh, you know, investors, um, you know, didn't do me right or did led me on or whatever. And I just play the long game. And a lot of those investors uh, that said no, uh, not necessarily all the ones that, you know, that, that didn't treat me right, but um, we definitely gave first dibs to the people who, who were, who said no, uh, like 10 times, you know, um, 
and some of those investors have been my most helpful investors and help help me build uh, my company today. So you know, I, I would say like if 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 investors are uh, our investors are great people to um, you know uh, build relationships with. Um, there's people that I've recruited for five years, um, that uh, six years, seven years that that uh, have joined us today in this venture that I've been recruiting for literally like seven years now. So um, that that now are are you know fundamental in building in building Lolly. So um, yeah, I would say always play the long game. I think that's been fundamental for success. Surrounding yourself with good people, both um, people that can you know that have specialties that can you know go build uh, things that you can't. Um, and then also investors that uh, will tell you no. Uh, and then also partners, um, you know, merchants that have told me like hundreds and hundreds of merchants that said, we're not interested in, in working with Cosmic. Um, we have over a thousand merchants today. And a lot of those merchants are people are, are merchants and, and people that, that didn't work with us with Cosmic. And they see that I've been right about the future and they you know, built trust over the last, or I built trust with them with over the last seven years. And now they've joined us uh, for for Lolly, and they're, we've made so much money together because uh, I played the long game, they played the long game, and and uh, I, I think that's been fundamental for our success as a, as a company and uh, my success as an individual. That is amazing advice, Alex. Really, really love that. I mean, literally the first line on your LinkedIn for the position for Lolly before you even talk about what Lolly is is building Lolly with incredible people. So I love how you point <laughs> out the importance of working with good people, surrounding yourself with good people. And uh, the second point that you made is also brilliant. A no today doesn't have to mean a no tomorrow. Um, the long game is super important. I think that we start to hold grudges and get upset and think that people are out to get us when we get turned down that first time. But a lot of times, you know, it's just the world that we live in. You got to prove credibility. You got to show a track record and uh, never just don't close that door too too tight because you never know where the opportunity can land in the future. Alex, just want to thank you so much for taking time to speak with me on In Their 20s. I loved your advice so much. I love what you're doing with Wally and I'm really, really excited for more young people to learn about Bitcoin through Wally. So thank you. Cool. Landon, thank you so much for having me and, and love what you're doing as well.